Hi everyone, this is Noah Sandler from MTGO Academy, and today I'm going to be continuing my Eternal Masters set review with Red. So, the first card we're going to do is Avarax, and it's not a particularly impactful card. Uh, you may not see it come up that often, uh, you're not going to play it too often, but uh, I wanted to take an aside here. Uh, to go over the card because I think it's the most difficult card in the entire set to evaluate. And uh, if you just want to skip ahead, I'm going to give Avarax a C. Um, and you can move on with the review. Uh, but if you wanted to do a little lesson on card evaluation, I'm going to do that now. So it's a 3-3 three, three with haste for 3 and 2 red. When there's a battlefield, you can search your library for a card named Avarax, reveal it, put it in your hand, shuffle your library. And you can give it uh, kind of a weak fire breathing. One and a red gives it plus one plus zero until I'm a turn. So first we'll look at the body to cost itself. You're paying five mana for a three three haste that has a weak form of fire breathing. I would typically say that four mana would be about right for this card, even then it wouldn't be you know, that powerful. Um, but it would be a playable card in red. And here we're adding on one red mana to the casting costs in order to. Uh, draw a card, and that card that you draw is another Avarax. Now, adding draw a card to a creature usually costs about one more, so the cost is sort of fair. So now we have to evaluate a random card compared to drawing Avarax. So you cast Avarax on turn five, it means you have access to five mana, and at that point in the game, you'd rather draw another. 3-3 three, three with haste for 5 mana, then a random card, which could be a land, which could be a 2-drop. Uh, you'd rather just have even an overcosted, um, you know, 5 mana card. You'd rather just have a bigger card at that stage of the game. So I would see Avarax is actually drawing a better card than normal, and the better card that you draw draws another better card than normal for that stage of the game. Now you might run into some problems if you're facing a Twisted Abomination that no matter how many Avaraxes you have, you might not be able to push through your opponent's defenses. So some variety of cards helps. Uh, you know, each 3-3 three, three might not necessarily be as good as the next 3-3. Three, three. But if you're facing a grindy removal heavy deck and they're just going to go one for one spot removal on the Avarax, then each card you draw is actually very good. So that about explains, or evaluates Avarax in a vacuum, uh, the power level of the card. Uh, but what's really interesting about it is it's got implications for deck building and drafting. Avarax may seem similar to Squadron Hawk, but as far as building your deck, it's got a pretty big difference in that it's a 5 drop. And in order to get value from Avarax, I feel like you want to have at least 3, so that you have two 3-3 three, three haste that actually draw a card. If you have two Avarax, I think that's okay, but it's pretty terrible if you actually draw both. And because the second one you draw is only the 3-3 three, three haste that pumps, it doesn't actually draw an additional card, you're not getting quite as much value for the first one that you play. But the problem is, if you're going to run three in your deck, that means you're playing three 5-drops. And you can't fit that many 5-drops into your deck. So 3 is actually a pretty reasonable amount of 5 drops, which means you don't have room for any others. Uh, you could maybe play a 4th or a 5th, but you're starting to make your deck really clunky. And so there's a lot of tension with wanting to run more Avaraxes, but not wanting to just have a bunch of 5 drops in your deck. So, like, Avarax works best if you're curving out, and you top your curve off with Avarax into Avarax into Avarax and finish the game off. But if you have an opening hand with just a bunch of 5 drops, you're just going to lose. So I think that it's really hard to justify running more than three uh, to give yourself four or five drops. Uh, maybe in a really grindy matchup where your opponent is just going to sit back behind a couple Hondins and remove your creatures one by one, then having four or five Avaraxes could be a legitimate win condition. That would be really hard for them to deal with. Now onto the actual drafting portion. Considering that you pretty much need to take three for you to be happy, uh, that means you're going to have to draft three Avaraxes. Sometimes you're not going to see three. So when you're considering taking the first Avarax, and it's that or a decent sideboard card, or maybe 23rd card filler, you have to consider that some of the time you're not going to end up with three Avaraxes, and some of the time you might need to take Avarax 
over something else important to get that third one. And so there's a lot of opportunity costs with having to spend three picks of your draft on a particular card. So all in all, I'm going to give Avarax a C. I think it's a reasonable late game plan if you don't have other late game. But that's balanced by the huge opportunity cost of having to draft uh, a few of them and put them in your deck and make your deck more clunky and take the space of other five drops that are better when you play them on turn five. Whew. Okay, finally, I swear, next card. We won't do that again. Uh, Battle Squadron. It's three and two red. It's a star star with flying, and its power and toughness are each equal to the number of creatures you control. So if it's the only creature on your board, it's a 1-1 one, one flying, which is pretty terrible. If you have two other creatures out, 3-3 three, three flying is marginal, but it, it's okay. And you want to have three or more creatures out to make it a 4-4 four, four flying, uh, like an air elemental or bigger, and that's when the card starts to get good. Um, you know, red is the place for the tokens archetype, so if you play this with a few Mog War Marshals or Beetleback Chiefs, uh, or as a top end uh, in the red-white tokens deck with Raise the Alarm, then you can frequently get this up to 5-5 five, five Flyer better. So it's actually a, a really nice curve topper in those decks. In your average red deck, if you're more grindy, removal-based, you're probably not going to run it. Uh, you're not planning to have more than maybe two creatures out on the board at a time. And you really want this to be minimum 3-3, but you're hoping for 4-4 when you're playing this card. So I'm going to give it a C+. Next up, we have Beetleback Chief, 2 and 2 red. It's a 2-2. Two, two. When it enters the battlefield, put two 1-1 one, one red goblin token creatures onto the battlefield. So this gives you 4 total power, 4 total toughness for 4 mana, which is a nice deal. And more importantly, it splits up into 3 creatures, and for the red aggressive decks, especially red-white tokens, just the, the getting more bodies in play is more important than getting one particularly large creature. And I think this format in general, uh, there's so many uh, like 2-2s two that have entered the battlefield abilities, and there's also so much great single-targeted removal. So investing your mana in one large creature isn't actually a great plan. So for a card to make multiple creatures that can trade off for your opponent's 2-2s, two um, I think that's actually where you want to be in this format. And I think Beetleback Chief is actually good in uh, more grindy, more controlling red decks also. Like, Black Red uh, gives you tokens to sacrifice to Carrion Feeder, uh, but gives you some value late game with Grave Digger or Rook Uprising, and can just stall the game a bit. Uh, but the card is definitely amazing and best in the Red White Tokens deck, so you can play Rally plus the Chief. If you flash it back, that's a lot of damage. 16, actually. So I'm going to give Beetleback Chief a B. Next card is Borderland Marauder, one in a red. It's one, two. When it attacks, it gets plus two, plus zero until on a turn. So you play it turn two, and it starts attacking as a three power creature. Um, so it, it gets damage in very quickly. Uh, it's basically the best thing you can do on turn two as a red deck. And it gives a lot of value to your burn spells like Firebolt, Carbonize, Flame Jab, that you can use to get rid of blockers and keep getting through for three every turn, and then eventually finish your opponent off with burn. It goes best in aggressive decks like Red White Tokens, Red Green Beats, but uh, also I think is decent in more grindy decks, uh, because if you do play it on turn two, it does let you interact because your opponent really has to trade for it. It races just about as well as, as something that an opposing aggressive deck can do, so they're probably going to trade some 2-2 for it. And in that sense, it's almost like a cheap burn spell. But once you get into three or more colors, you're less likely to be able to hit it on turn two, and its value goes down because it doesn't block well. It's just a one-two. So it needs to be smashing in there for you to get value from it. So I'm going to give Borderland Marauder a C+. Next up, we have Burning Vengeance. Two and a red enchantment. Whenever you cast a spell from your graveyard, Burning Vengeance deals two damage to target creature or player. So this card is powerful enough that it spawns its own archetype, and I think red-blue in general as a deck uh, it is not that good unless if you can get Burning Vengeance and go for the flashback theme. 
I think red blue aggressive deck can work. Borderland Marauder, Phantom Monster, and then back it up with Burn and Bounce. I think that can be fine. Uh, but basically, you'd, you'd want to go for a Burning Vengeance deck if you can. So I think one of the problems with that is if you don't get a Burning Vengeance, then I think your deck is pretty weak. I think it's very important that you actually get the Burning Vengeance in order to go into this archetype. So until like if you first like if you see a Burning Vengeance in your first pack, I think it's fine to take it and then try to move into the archetype. Uh, don't necessarily completely force it in case if it's not there. But I think that's a good opportunity to go into the deck. Or if you're maybe not quite there to start the draft off, maybe you're, you're taking some good blue and green cards, a couple flashback cards, and then pack two you see a Burning Vengeance. I think you could move in and, and try to make something work uh, in a, a three or more color deck. Once you get Burning Vengeance, your priority pick number one is Flame Jab. Uh, when you combine them together, every land you discard lets you split up three damage. And it's really hard to lose the game once you're doing that. Una's Grace also works pretty well, uh, since you're drawing more cards, so you're going to draw more lands, and you're more likely to, to just keep triggering the Vengeance. And there's plenty of already great flashback cards like Deep Analysis, Firebolt, Silent Departure. Uh, I'm not too big on Desperate Ravings, even in the Vengeance deck, because you do not want to discard your Burning Vengeance. It's really, really bad if you do and you do tend to draw through your deck pretty well. Um, so it's a little risky. A lot of times you're going to just leave it in your hand because you like the cards in your hand, you don't want to risk losing them. So I think the card's playable in that deck, but uh, not something that you need to run. So Burning Vengeance is uh, you know, a bit of a risk to move in on. Um, if you don't get the Burning Vengeances, I think your deck could end up pretty bad. Um, and if uh, you don't get the right flashback cards, you know it, it's risky. You're, you're putting yourself in a a bit of a prone position, but uh, it is so powerful. If you do get the deck, if you get a couple Burning Vengeance, it's just about the best thing you can do in the format. So the card itself, I'm going to give it a B plus. Next up is Carbonize, two and a red, instant. It deals three damage to target creature or player. That creature can't be regenerated this turn. The creature would die this turn, exile it instead. So instant speed, it's a very solid removal spell can go face to finish your opponent off. And I think one of the most key interactions with this card is that it can remove a Twisted Abomination. It prevents regeneration and exiles the creature. So I think that's one of the, the real great ways to counter uh, an opposing Twisted Abomination. Uh, and as a red deck, usually you're, gonna have, you're really gonna struggle to deal with it. So I think that comes up reasonably often. And it also prevents uh, dying triggers like Debridge Shaman, though worth noting that it struggles against Coalition Honor Guard since it's not big enough to kill it. But it's a card that you're going to play in every single one of your red decks, and it's also splashable, so I'm going to give it a B. Next we have Chain Lightning, one red sorcery. It deals three damage to target creature or player. Then that player or that creature's controller can pay two red. If they do, they can throw it back at you and then you can throw it back in them, and so so on. So it's basically a weaker Lightning Bolt, it's sorcery speed, but three damage for one mana is just a great deal. It's amazing for tempo, so you get to cast something and play Chain Lightning in the same turn, and then also being able to go face, so you can just burn your opponent out sometimes. So the efficiency of this card makes it a really high pick, and I'm gonna give it a B plus. Next up is Crater Hellion. 4 and 2 red, 6-6 six, six with Echo 4 and 2 red. When it enters the battlefield, it deals 4 damage to each other creature. So, wow, this card is powerful. Uh, against certain decks, red-white tokens, elf decks, blue-white flyers, you're killing every creature they have, and you're getting a 6-6 six, six on the board. So this is one of the swingiest plays in this format. And even if your opponent has something that survives it, like a, an Empire Crocodile, you're probably killing all their other creatures, so the Crocodile is probably dying too. And there just aren't that many large creatures in this format. This kills pretty much everything in the format, and is an amazing deck in grindy red-black, red-black-white, red-blue decks, and is a slam bomb for those decks. The one issue with it is red tends to be an aggressive color, 
So it, it's very awkward in red-white tokens. I feel like I typically wouldn't play it in red-white tokens, though I think red-green beats can probably still play it. You might have a creature that survives it, and it's just a large creature, and it's just so good against uh, so many strategies that uh, it's just a card that wins the game by itself. So even if it doesn't work well with the rest of your strategy, if you get up to six mana, sometimes you just play it and you win. So uh, I'm going to give Crater Hellion an A-. minus. Next up is Desperate Ravings. One in a red, instant. Draw two cards, then discard a card at random, and it flashes back for two and a blue. So upon the first cast, you're even on card advantage, and when you flash it back, you go up one. If you add to that that some of the cards you'll be discarding will have flashback, and it works with Burning Vengeance, uh, it makes it so the card can be playable. Now the problem is the random discard is a really bad thing, and I talked about it with him to Torok on how amazing random discard is against a good player, because they're crafting their plan over multiple turns, they're setting things up to try to get the most value out of their cards. If you hit the wrong, like if you hit the right card with him to Torok, everything they've been doing is is suddenly over, and it's almost as if they just made the wrong plays for multiple turns. So, if you consider yourself a good player, why would you play a card that can ruin whatever plans you're, you've been trying to make? And this card is going to do it twice to you. Now, if you time it, so you just have lands in hand, like if you have five lands in hand, you have Desperate Ravings, you're going to draw two cards and very likely just discard a land. So it's pretty good there. Um, so, you find the right way to time this card can alleviate some of the risks. But unlike normal looting, there's just such a great risk that you're going to dump uh, one of the best cards in your deck. So if you have even one really good card in your hand, it's just very risky to cast this card. Like, if you lose that card, it can just cost you the game. And I just don't think that the value that you get from this card is there to justify such risk and adding such randomness to your game. So I'm going to give Desperate Ravings a D. Next up, Dragon Egg. 2 and a red, 0 2 defender. When it dies, put a 2 2 flying dragon token with fire breathing onto the battlefield. Now, this card can be okay as sideboard against a green deck, a deck that's attacking with a lot of ground creatures, because you can put it out there. Um, once it dies, a 2 2 flyer with fire breathing for 3 mana is a great deal. So, if you expect your opponent to be attacking a lot with ground creatures, this can either stop them from attacking, or yeah, you, you get your 2-2 flyer fire breathing for 3, which is a good deal. But I tend not to play this in decks that can't abuse it in some way. So you want to have self-sacrifice effects, so Carrion Feeder, Innocent Blood, and Wake of Vultures are a few important ones. So this card is actually quite good in the Black-Red Aristocrats deck. Uh, it still can run a pro into problems since it's a token creature. It gets mana ward after you do the work to sacrifice it. But it's generally good value in that deck. So uh, these go late. It's not something you have to pick up early. But once you have enough sacrifice outlets, it becomes a, a quite a good card. And I, I wouldn't run. Uh, I wouldn't mind even running multiples once you have enough outlets. Because, uh, yeah, just three mana for a Windrake that has fire breathing. Fire breathing is really nice on flying creatures. Uh, so I'm going to give Dragon Egg a C-. Next up is Dual Caster Mage. 1 and 2 red, 2-2 two, two flash. When it enters a battlefield, copy target instant or sorcery spell. You may choose new targets for the copy. Now, I've never liked this card in cube. It just seems too random or too expensive. Uh, if you have a lot of burn spells yourself, you can maybe pull this off in a good way. You play Firebolt and Dual Caster it for 4 mana. You get a 2-2 and deal extra 2 damage, and that's pretty good. Though it's not much better than a get to Slinger. And Mage can also work on your opponent's spells, but it's just so random um, to be able to predict when your opponent's going to play an instant or sorcery. And red decks don't usually sit with their mana up too often. You want to be casting stuff. So just sitting back multiple turns, waiting for your opponent to play an instant or sorcery, I think is pretty unlikely to work. Uh, maybe it has some sideboarding implications if your opponent has deep analysis, since you'd be pretty happy to uh, you know, play a 2-2 for 3 and draw 2 cards. 
Um, you can leave it open on turn four when they might play it, and then once it's in their graveyard, there's a decent chance they're going to flash it back on the next turn. But even in a deck with a lot of burn, I, I just don't like the card that much. So I'm going to give it a D+. Next we have Faithless Looting. One red sorcery, draw two cards, then discard two cards, and it flashes back for two and a red. Now the first time you use it, it is card disadvantage, because you're using three cards that hit the graveyard, you're including the looting, and you're drawing two cards. And when you flash it back, you're equal, but by the time you flash it back, usually you'll wait until you have a land at least in hand that, you know, it's later in the game, so you're, you know, cycling through lands you don't need, so even though you're going even, um, it's, it's closer to maybe drawing a card. So it is possible to make this card end up sort of even, even when you're not necessarily taking advantage of it. And the first loot could also do that, though usually you loot earlier in the game where the value of looting when you're losing a card in the deal is not quite as high, since you need lands and spells. But the true value of this card is that it dumps a lot of cards into your graveyard. So if you want to reanimate things, this can help you do it. If you're discarding flashback spells, that can get around the card disadvantage. And it's also flashback for Burning Vengeance, goes really well in that deck. So while I don't always play this card, I think it's pretty reasonable. And then just late game, it prevents you from flooding out. Uh, so I'm going to give Faithless Looting a C+. Next up is Fervent Cathar, 2 and a red, 2, 1 haste. When it enters the battlefield, target creature can't block this turn. So we last saw Voldaren Duelist for three and a red was a 3-2 with this ability, and that was a pretty strong card. Giving it minus one, minus one, and reducing a mana from the cost. Uh, it's hard to say whether that makes it better or worse, but I think in this format, there's just so many 2-2s two that Cathar will trade into, that Duelist would trade into as well. So I think Cathar is probably a little bit better. Now, because the body's so weak, you're only playing this in aggressive decks, I think it's good in red-green and red-white tokens. I'm less interested in it in red-black since I think you're more of a, a grindy value deck and just paying 3 mana for 2-1 isn't that good. But the turn you play it, uh, if your opponent has no creatures out, you get 2 damage from the haste and then they have to deal with it, and that's fine. Uh, but it's best if your opponent has you know one big creature, you curved out, so you have a couple creatures, you play Cathar, so not only do you get the two damage, but you get the other damage that you wouldn't be able to attack with. So for three mana, it might actually give you five damage, then give you a two one on the board afterwards. So it can be a pretty nice card in aggressive decks. So I'm gonna give Cathar a C plus. Next up is Firebolt, one red, sorcery, deals two damage to target creature player and flashes back for four and a red. Now two damage kills a lot of things in this format. Um, a lot of them do have come into play effects, but you still have to deal with them at some point, and Firebolt does that. It also hits utility creatures, Mother of Runes before it becomes active, Looter, Prodigal uh, Sorcerer, and then flashes back late in the game. You can pay six mana to split up four damage, or just go four to the face. Uh, so it's just a very solid burn spell, and one of the best commons in the set, so I'm going to give Firebolt a B+. Next up is Flame Jab, one red sorcery, it deals one damage to target creature or player, and has Retrace, so you can discard a land card and pay its mana cost to cast it from your graveyard as many times as you want for as many lands and mana that you have. So on its own, it's a pretty solid card. If your opponent has uh, one toughness creatures, you trade one for one, and then it gives you the option uh, throughout the game to turn extra lands into removal spells. Uh, it can help you finish off a creature post-combat, or start going face if you get your opponent pretty low. Uh, so it's, it's a nice card um, just by itself, um, but it is amazing with Burning Vengeance. It's just really broken with that card. So uh, if you have Burning Vengeance, Flame Jab is probably like just about the best card in the format once you have a Vengeance out. So you're going to pick it over basically anything at that point. Uh, but until you get a Vengeance, uh, I think the card is good, um, but probably about on par with Firebolts, maybe slightly weaker. So I'm going to give it a B. Gamble, one red sorcery, 
Search your library for a card, put that card in your hand, discard a card at random, then shuffle your library. So if you have a really good card that is a bomb like Goblin Trenches, Burning Vengeance, some Hondans, um, then th this could be worth it um, to, to tutor for them. Um, if you have a lot of flashback, then the risk of discarding a card is is reduced. Um, and if you cast this early in the game, then you're going to have five or six cards in your hand, so you're typically not going to lose the card that you gamble for. Uh, so you're usually upgrading your hand a bit, um, but you need something really good because you are accepting card advantage to cast this card. Uh, the card that you get has to be really good to um, pay off for the card disadvantage, but there's also the chance that you just discard the card that you get, in which case you just threw away a card and you reduce the quality of your deck by losing a key card. So the card is a gamble for sure, um, but I think you need some key cards to grab with it. Um, Crater Hellion, like a, a good Wrath effect could also work. Uh, and then if you are red-black and you have Grave Digger or Borg Uprising, gambling for a creature is a lot less risky. Uh, so it has some applications and can be very powerful if it works, but the riskiness of the card, I don't like to play it in uh, my average red deck, so I'm going to give it a C-. Next up is Gitu Slinger, Tuna Red. It's a 2-2 with Echo Tuna Red. When it enters the battlefield, it deals 2 damage to target creature or player. So this can go face and finish your opponent off, um, but uh, typically like, there's a lot of two twos in the format, so you're going to get a, a two for one uh, a lot of the time. Uh, the echo can definitely be a problem, because uh, there's a decent number of echo cards in red, and it can really disrupt your curve if you're playing too many of them, uh, even good ones like Get Two Slinger. So if you end up playing on turn three, you kill your opponent's elf, you're happy about that. But then turn four, having to pay echo and not playing a four drop, uh, it just slows down your tempo so much. Uh, sometimes you're just going to play it and not pay echo to just keep um, you know, playing better things, doing better things with your mana. So I feel like this card isn't quite on Necrotal level. Um, one thing that's worth noting uh, with these types of cards, uh, with Coalition and Honor Guard, I had the situation come up where I punted a game, my opponent was basically at one life, I'd get to Slinger, and they had Honor Guard out, and I thought I had to target the Honor Guard. You don't. Uh, Honor Guard used to work that way, but the it's been updated so it's only activated or uh, activated abilities or spells that have to target Honor Guard. So get to Slinger, Necrotal, Haunted of Infinite Rage, triggered abilities, Mana War, they don't have to target the Honor Guard. So. I lost the game because I didn't know that. Um, so I lost that game, so you guys don't have to. But Get to Slinger is still a very solid card. I'm going to give it a B. Next up is Hanan of Infinite Rage, two and a red, legendary enchantment shrine. At the beginning of your upkeep, it deals damage to target creature or player equal to the number of shrines you control. Now, I've always been a big fan of Hondans ever since they were released in Champions block, and through uh, Legends Cube, they were amazing. So I didn't think I could be very wrong as far as their power level, but uh, when I first saw this set, my original estimate at the Red Hanan was going to be a C+. Since I expected that people would be doing such powerful things with all these great cards in the format, and aggressive decks would want to be getting you know faster damage to the face than just one a turn, and drafting Hanans can feel like a wild goose chase, because they might not show up, they might not be in the colors that you are, and the red one, red tends to just be uh, like a two-color pair since it's more aggressive. So I felt like Con of Infinite Rage you know, was going to be decent, but not great. But I was totally wrong. Uh, I mean, not only are Hanans really important in the format, um, looking at the drafts I've played, the ones where I've had multiple Hanans, I've won a lot more than drafts where I haven't. And uh, there's just a lot of one toughness creatures as well in this format. So just having Hanan by itself is actually quite good. And it's one of the better Hanans to have uh, if you have multiples. And it's basically a prodigal sorcerer by itself, like same mana. A little less flexible because sorcerer you can finish off a creature post combat or do something on your opponent's turn. But uh, the Hanans have just been going up and up in my pick orders. Uh, so uh, red one, yeah, great by itself, great with other Hanans. 
Uh, and I think you should start picking Hanans early. It's early in the draft. I think they're, they're just great first picks. Uh, so I'm going to give it a B plus. Next up is Kellen Champion. 2-2 two and two red, 3-2 haste. Echo for 2-2 two and two red. When it enters the battlefield, it deals 3 damage to target player. Now, if your opponent ever doesn't have creatures up and, uh, to block and you get to drop Champion, you hit your opponent for 6, and then you can pay Echo, and then they've got to deal with your 3-2. And so that's amazing for an aggressive deck. Now, I don't think that ends up happening too often, because uh, there's just so many 2-2s two with coming to play abilities that end up on the board. So I think a lot of time you play it, and it trades with a 2-2 two -two that already got some value, and you hit your opponent for 3. So it's kind of like paying 4 mana, deal 3 to your opponent, and deal 2 to a creature. Um, but it's you know, less targeted. Uh, and then, uh, w w which is pretty decent. Um, though, if you're playing a controlling deck, you're not really interested in that effect, since if your opponent has a high life total, they can just take the damage, force you to pay Echo, and then deal with the champion. Uh, but the Echo cost is pretty rough, so if you're not getting that first hit in, um, like if your opponent has some walls out even, uh, you know, paying 8 mana to, to get a 3-2 afterwards is pretty expensive. Uh, so it's, it's a card that's good in aggressive decks, um, but also a 4-drop that you know takes the Echo, like you, you can't play a 5-drop. Uh, so I'm not huge on the card overall, so I'm going to give it a C+. Next up is Keldon Marauders. It's one in a red, 3-3 three, three with Vanishing 2. So it enters the battlefield with two time counters on it. If you're upkeep, you remove one. When the last counter is removed, you sacrifice it. Uh, and when it enters the battlefield or leaves the battlefield, it deals one damage to the target player. So Marauders is going to come out, uh, could you know block on the turn you play it, and it's going to attack for one turn. Your opponent chumps it or just takes the damage. So they're either going to take two damage or five damage and then it dies. Now, if you're just in an all-out burn-the-face deck, uh, dealing five damage to your opponent from one card is perfectly fine, something you're willing to do. But the most aggressive deck in the format, red-white tokens, wants creatures that are going to stay on the board so you can use Rally with them. So Marauders isn't the best fit there. And while it can be cool in the red-black Aristocrats deck since it sacrifices itself, and uh, you could sack it to you know, carry and feed her, um, you know, when, when it's about to die. Uh, I feel like that deck actually isn't too aggressive, and so it doesn't really want to play a card that just kills itself and doesn't trade for a card. Um, and there are a couple ways to abuse Marauders. Reckless Charge can work, but if your opponent has any creature up, they're probably just going to chump. And so it, that's decent, but it's not like an amazing combo. It's nice that it lets you attack twice with the Marauders. But I wouldn't just go jamming Marauders into any deck with Reckless Charge. So pretty simple. If you're trying to go face um, really hard, I think Marauders is okay. I still think it's about filler level. And then in any other deck, it just it basically just sacrifices itself. So it's not worth a card. Uh, so I'm going to give it a D plus. Curd Ape, one red. It's a one one, and it gets plus one plus two as long as you control a forest. So you're only going to play this in red green. Uh, if you do play it, you get it turn 1, you play the forest turn 2, you're attacking with a 2-3, and that's really nice in this format. So not only are you attacking for 2 damage on turn 2, which is a great way to start races, but 2-3 means that it wins against all the 2-2s two that are in the format. So it's a card that's actually relevant in the mid-game as well. And it's a great card to start playing Pump Spells on, or Elephant Guide. So this Flint Hoof Boar and Bloodbraid Elf are the reasons to go into the red-green beats archetype. Um, if you get a lot of those cards, I think the archetype's pretty strong. Uh, though a lot of times, I think it falls short. Uh, but Curd Ape is a card you want there. They tend to go late because you do have to be red-green, and it's not one of the more popular archetypes. Uh, but it is very good in that archetype. So if it's in the middle of pack, uh, I, I would just take the Curd Apes. Uh, and, and it also helps you force other people out of the archetype as well. So I'm going to give Curd Ape a C+. Next we have Mog Fanatic. One red, it's a 1-1. One, one. You can sacrifice it. It deals one damage to target creature or player. So you can play this as just a oh, one mana ping. So in some matchups that's going to be decent. You kill a Mistral Charger or Land War Elves. And you could also chump and ping or maybe get a couple attacks in before you have to ping. So it gives you a little extra value. 
but it can get kind of weak late game, and it, it only attacks for one damage. So uh, the card is generally a bit weak. Uh, I think the place I like to play it is in the Red Black Aristocrats deck, because it does sacrifice itself, so it turns on your Tragic Slips and Wake Dancers. So I think it's fine there, um, but I don't like it too much elsewhere. So I'm going to give it a D+. Next up is Mog War Marshal. One in a red. It's a 1-1 one, one with Echo, one in a red. When it enters the battlefield or dies, put a 1-1 one, one red goblin token onto the battlefield. So this card can eventually make three creatures by itself uh, for just paying four mana overall. And that's similar to Beetle Black Chief. So if your goal is just to flood the board with tokens, with red-white tokens, this is one of your uh, you know key cards in the archetype. But it's also quite cool in red-black aristocrats. It gives you three creatures to sacrifice to a carrion feeder. And also you can go turn two war marshal, turn three don't pay echo, and play wake dancer. Uh, so that's a pretty nice curve out. And it can frequently be an interesting decision whether you want to pay echo or not. Um, if you have a you know, better turn three play to keep the tempo up, I think it's fine to just not pay. You paid two mana, you got two one ones, and that's a reasonable deal. Um, but if nothing else is really going on, then yeah, you pay the mana, gives you an extra chump blocker, a uh, little insurance against mass removal. Um, so yeah, all, overall very solid card. Uh, some of you're happy to play in aggressive decks, and um, it is a key synergy card for aristocrats and the red white tokens deck. So I'm gonna give it a B minus. Next we have Orcish Oriflam, three and a red enchantment. Attacking creatures you control get plus one plus zero. Oh. So I think the only place for this deck is the red-white tokens deck, or just a tokens-heavy deck. Maybe you could be red-black with a lot of Mog War Marshals. Um, but I don't think it does enough in other decks. Uh, even the red-green beats deck, you only want a couple creatures in play usually, uh, so you're not getting enough value from it. But with red-white tokens, if you can get four creatures on the battlefield, um, each of them now trades into... Like if you get the one ones, they now trade into all these 2-2s two running around. And they give you more damage to your opponent's face if you just attack with everything. If they're able to block kill a couple of your creatures, you're getting more to face, and so you're getting closer to finishing your opponent off. It's not as good as Rally the Peasants, but you don't always get three Rally the Peasants in your red-white tokens decks, so I think this is a solid card to fulfill that role. But since it's not important in any other archetype, they go super late, so I'm going to give it a D+. Next up is Price of Progress, one in a red instant. It deals damage to each player equal to twice the number of non-basic lands that player controls. So I think this is something that you just can't play main deck. You don't know how many non-basic lands your opponent's going to play, and while there are the gain lands that are popular, um, not deck is even running non Not every deck is even running non-basic lands. Uh, this card also hits you for yours, uh, though you're typically going to play it in an aggressive red deck, so you're probably just two colors, and decent chance you're not running any non-basics. Or if you do, you might not care about it since you're just going face. But the main problem with the card is that it's hard to predict how many non-basic lands your opponents will have, uh, even just based off the, the games that you play. Like, you play game one, how many non-basic lands you need to see... Um, I don't know too much about Bayesian inferences, but you you have to kind of predict based on um, you know what what cards they're playing, uh, what their mana base looks like. Are they trying to cast double color cards and in what seems like a splash color? Because if they're just two colors and you see two dual lands, um, th that's probably all the ones that they're running. Um, and if you're hoping to get lucky enough to deal 4 damage to your opponent for 2 mana, the card's just not that good. Uh, that said, there are decks that run uh, you know, maybe 7 gain lands. Uh, you know, 4 color, 5 color decks, they just play as many as they can. Uh, and in that case, Price of could deal 6 or more damage, and it becomes good there. So I think that's the spot for it, but I feel like that's going to come up extremely rarely. So I don't think this is, a, this is like a sideboard card that you need to pick up, but if you do pick one up, there are times where you'll side it in. So I'm going to give it a D. Next card is Pyroblast, one red instant. Choose one counter target spell if it's blue, or destroy target permanent if it's blue. Uh, we already went over Hydroblast, so these are very good sideboard cards. 
Um, but since they only attack one color, the majority of the time your opponent isn't going to be playing blue, so you're not going to get them for any game one, and you're only going to be able to get it for uh, you know some number of game twos and games two and three. So as powerful as it is, you can't justify a high pick on it. Uh, but it is so good as a sideboard card that if you're considering it versus filler for your deck, um, I, I would definitely rather take the strong sideboard card. Uh, so I'm going to give it a C plus and feel like you should take it above replacement level uh, cards for your deck. But never over anything in the B range. Next up is Pyrokinesis, 4 and 2 red, an instant. You can exile a red card from your hand rather than paying its mana cost and it deals 4 damage divided as you choose among any number of target creatures. So this doesn't go face, uh, unlike Pyrotechnics, which was an amazing limited card uh, that split 4 damage for 5 mana, but could also go face. And not being able to go face is pretty relevant, uh, so there are definitely times where you just your opponent's have 4 life and you win when you play Pyrotechnics, so you can't do that with this card. But this card is playable by exiling a red card for a hand. Now if you do that, you're giving up you know, it is a bit of card disadvantage compared to casting it for six, but the fact that it's instant speed and you can do it whenever and your opponent will never expect it, so whatever, their, their pump spell, you tap out, they think they can elephant guide something, in response you take out two of their creatures and the elephant guide, then you're up cards um, even after exiling a card. Uh, and there's a lot of small creatures in this format, a lot of two toughness creatures, one toughness creatures, so you're frequently going to get a two-for-one with this card, and sometimes more. Um, maybe your opponent's on Squadron Hawk, and Pyrokinesis could take out, you know, four of them. Uh, so yeah, very strong card. Um, yeah, going to give it a B plus. Next up, Reckless Charge. One red sorcery. Dark creature gets plus three plus O, and gains haste until on a turn. You can flash it back for two and a red. So this is a card that strictly goes face, so you only want this in decks that are just trying to bring your opponent out, but it has the potential to actually deal a ton of damage, because uh, you charge something that could have attacked otherwise, uh, you're getting the 3 damage and the, uh, the creature's power, uh, so that could be 5 damage, 6, 7, uh, assuming your opponent can't block, and then you get to flashback it later, so you potentially could get even more damage. So if your opponent isn't playing a deck with creatures and they're tapping out a lot, uh, this could be so much damage. Uh, but typically they'll have some creatures, it's not going to work out as well as that. And since it's a card that is so inflexible, uh, like you're just going to play in aggressive decks, and sometimes it's not going to be great. Uh, so if you have a lot of creatures and not too many pump spells, uh, it's definitely something I'm going to play. Um, but it's never too exciting, so I'm going to give it a C-. Next up, Rorix Bladewing. 3-3 three and three red, 6-5 Flying Haste, and it's a legendary creature dragon. Uh, so Rorix is another one of those big creatures, which tend not to do too well in this format, uh, but because it's haste and flying and has 6 power, usually it's getting in for 6 damage the turn that you play it, and then your opponent has to deal with it. Uh, and that adds up a lot. If you're playing red, you already have a lot of burn, and so the 6 damage you get from Rorix might just be enough to finish the game. So it has a nice edge over uh, some of the other um, like Pit Fighter Legends that cost 3 of their color and 3 colorless. And I don't think you're going to cut it even in red-white tokens decks, because uh, I think the 6 damage is just so much, then your opponent has to deal with it. Um, but it is a 6 drop that's relatively aggressive, and that's always a little awkward. Uh, and because it's triple red, uh, it's hard to play it in multicolor decks, um, but it's still really, really strong, uh, and one of the better car red cards in the format, so uh, I'm going to give it a B plus. It's close to an A minus, but I'm going to go B plus. Next up, Seismic Stomp, one in a red, sorcery, creatures without flying, can't block this turn. Now, I'm going to be honest, I have actually never, I'm trying to think, maybe once or twice in my whole Magic career have I actually cast a card like this, and I hear a lot from people that it, it's a good sideboard card, and I'll take their word for it, I draft it, it ends up in my board, and I, I just can't seem to get myself decided in. Uh, you just need a particular situation to occur where your opponent has a bunch of ground creatures out, 
and you just need to deal damage to your opponent's face. It's another card like Reckless Charge that only deals damage to your opponent's face, um, yet it there's no potential for card advantage. It pretty much just has to kill your opponent, or it does nothing. And I just don't like those cards that much. Uh, I can imagine the matchups for it. You're facing a, a slower green deck with big creatures, and you're trying to attack them, and then, you've, okay, they've recovered, and now you have a big board out, you play Seismic Stomp and attack for 8 damage, and you win. Uh, so that seems nice, I can see that, uh, but it just hasn't happened for me yet. So uh, in the times when it seems close, I, there's just a card that I'd prefer that seems a little more flexible that I'd run over it. And then, yeah, what if your opponent has a flying creature, like, randomly? So... It's just kind of a weird card. Um, other people tend to like a little better cyborg cards, and I, I can see, I can see it. It's just never come up with for me. And I've played a lot of Magic, so I feel like this isn't a card that you actually have to prioritize for your board. Um, but I don't know. Maybe there's something I'm missing, and it, it's a lot better than I think. Uh, but I'm going to give it a D. One card I do like a lot is Siege Gang Commander. 3 and 2 red. It's a 2-2. Two, two. When it enters the battlefield, put 3 one, one goblin tokens onto the battlefield. You can pay 1 a red, sacrifice a goblin, deals 2 damage to target creature or player. So, Siege Gang has always been an amazing limited card. It just puts so many... Like, it spreads itself so wide that your opponent can't deal with it with one card unless if they have a wrath effect. And even if your opponent has a bunch of blockers, you can just keep attacking and... You, you know, whatever gets blocked, you just throw at your opponent's face. Um, and it's also just 8 damage to your opponent's face if you have enough time. Uh, you know, even if they have a, a, you know, completely locked down board, you can just fire it at your opponent's face, and that's a ton of damage. Uh, and red decks usually have other ways of dealing damage to your opponent's face. So, it's a great finisher. Uh, and then, on top of that, I think uh, in this format, it's probably at its best that it's ever been. So I was already prepared to give it a high grade, B plus, A minus, but in this format, uh, for the red-white tokens deck, you have ways to pump all your tokens, so it's amazing there. For the aristocrats deck, this is a sack outlet, can trigger your morbid, and it's a format that's all about these you know, two-for-one creatures, uh, you know, two-twos, and so Siege Gang just, just runs those over, can give you a lot of card advantage, or you can use Gravedigger or, or Uprising, Animate Dead, get it back. Um, so it's just incredible and definitely one of the best cards in the set. And I'm going to give it an A. Next up, we have Sneak Attack. Three and a red enchantment. You can pay a red, put a creature card from your hand on the battlefield, gets haste, and you sacrifice it at the beginning of the next end step. Uh, so a uh, great constructed card, not a good limited card. Uh, I even really dislike it in Cube, where there are some really sick combos you can pull off with it. Uh, just the kind of cards that you have to draft if you don't get your sneak attack, uh, like your deck just ends up not very good. Um, and then I, mean, I, I see no reason why it would be better in this format. Um, so uh, there are a couple cool things you can do with it with Avarax. If you have like five or six Avaraxes, you can just sneak attack, just boom, 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 just fire them all at your opponent, uh, and that's kind of cool. Uh, I, I hope you can pull that off. I don't think I'm the one who's going to be doing that, uh, but yeah, it, it's just like having to lose the creature. Uh, it's just so situational that you're going to have creatures in your hand that you wouldn't rather just cast, that you want to just throw at your opponent. Um, so yeah, just I, I don't like the card. I'm going to give it a D minus. Next we have Sting Scourger, 1 in a red, 2-2, two, two. Echo 3 in a red. When it enters the battlefield, return target creature and opponent controls to its owner's hand. So it only bounces things your opponent has, so you can't return a creature that's been pacified. But can do similar things uh, against you know, an elephant-guided creature. Uh, it is a triggered ability, so it gets past Coalition Honor Guard. But really it just tries to mimic Mana War, and it's, it's nowhere near as good. Uh, the Echo 4 is a huge cost to pay, um, and so while this says 2 mana, uh, you're not casting it before turn 4, uh, where you can play it, hopefully play it in something else, and then you get to decide if you want to pay Echo. Um, it's maybe 50-50 whether you do 
tutus are valuable, so you're usually going to want to pay, I suppose, but it's such a huge tempo loss. Like, you, you gain the tempo, and then you spend your whole turn just to hold your 2-2 in play, so you kind of give it right back. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm a bit lower on this card than I have been in the past. And there's other red echo creatures, and running multiples is, is very bad. It's just hard to sequence them, because each of them takes two turns to um, you know, function fully. And if this is just two mana, bounce target creature opponent controls, that's really bad. But it does get better in the Aristocrats deck. Since you play it, maybe on your opponent's turn, you, you chump with it, and you can sacrifice it to your Carrion Feeder. Um, or you can just let the Echo, uh, you can just not pay the Echo on your turn, and then play Wake Dancer or something. Um, but overall, pretty decent card. Uh, obviously great against the Aura's deck, uh, so I'm going to give it a C+. Next we have one of the most unfair cards in the set, Sulfuric Vortex. One and two red. Enchantment at the beginning of each player's upkeep. It deals two damage to that player. If a player would gain life, that player gains no life instead. So this shuts off all of your opponent's life gain, uh, which may seem like a kind of random thing, uh, but it can matter a lot when both players are taking two damage every turn. Uh, and this helps you guarantee that you can kill your opponent in time. So if you have some burn to back it up, uh, you can set up a situation where your opponent's going to kill you in two turns, but you have just enough burn to kill them in one turn. Now once you play Vortex, the game is going to end very quickly, and the player that has the board advantage will usually end up winning the game, um, but since you're red, uh, and what makes this card so great? Like, it wouldn't be that great in some other colors, um, but you're already playing this aggressive style. Uh, this isn't a card you're going to play in a, a grindy black-red-white control deck, um, but you play it in an aggressive deck, red-white tokens, uh, red-green beats, if you can play a Borderland Marauder and then turn three, either a creature and follow up with Vortex, or maybe just turn three Vortex, uh, your opponent's on a quick clock. And if you have Burn, you're probably going to be able to finish them off before they can finish you off. Uh, and it doesn't really matter what bombs they have. So this kind of neutralizes some really powerful card advantage engines because your opponent just doesn't have time to take advantage of them. So this is a great card to counter Hondans and is a nightmare for any control deck to face. Uh, so you can't play it in every red deck, but in the aggressive red decks where you can, the card is amazing, and uh, so I'm going to give it a B plus. Next we have Tooth and Claw, three and a red enchantment, sacrifice two creatures, put a 1-1 one, one red beast creature token onto the battlefield. So this is a card that I have never played. It looks like it could be decent, uh, so I'm not going to call it unplayable. Now, obviously, there's two spots you could play it. One is the red-white tokens deck, where the creatures that you're sacrificing are just 1-1s. One um, and uh, there, I guess, what you can do is just make a bunch of tokens. It's, it kind of works like Orcish Aura Flam in that sense, where you attack with a bunch of creatures, your opponent blocks a few. The ones they block, you sacrifice to make a 3-1. So you kind of keep your pressure on the board, um, but I don't know, that doesn't sound that good. Um, and then the other spot is the black-red Aristocrats deck, where that'd be the obvious spot for it since it is a sacrifice outlet and you can get advantage um, and also use the extra beast token. Uh, so it could be pretty cool with Blood Artist and maybe helps you get some value from your Echo creatures without paying Echo, but... Uh, the problem I have with it is uh, these types of cards where you can sacrifice a creature for effect, uh, they tend to be good against removal, uh, and that's why they're good. If you're in a grindy matchup, your opponent's going to go one for one, then every time they kill your creature, you sacrifice and you get an effect. Like, Field of Souls can work that way. But Tooth and Claw requires you to sacrifice two creatures each time, so your opponent plays a removal spell. Yeah, you cheated a little bit on the cost of Tooth and Claw, but you still have to sacrifice one of your other creatures that hasn't been targeted, and you get a 3-1 out of it. Uh, like, that's not that good. Uh, I mean, 3-1 creature is not that good. Um, I mean, if you got, like, a 3-3 three, three out of it, I think this card would be quite a bit better. Um, but overall, I'm just not seeing it. Uh, so even the decks where this would seem like it would be the best fit, I feel like they're probably just better cards to run. Um, so... 
Yeah, I'm going to give it a D-. minus. Next up, Undying Rage. Two and a red. Aura. Enchanted creature gets plus two plus two and can't block. When it's put in the graveyard from the battlefield, return it to owner's hand. So if you have lots of creatures, this lets you turn each one into a more valuable creature, trade it off, and then turn your next creature into a more valuable creature. Uh, you can also use it on your opponent's creature to make that creature not block. So if you're in a situation, you're being very aggressive, and you need to poke through for some extra damage, uh, that can be a pretty nice play. If your opponent's playing Glacial Wall, it basically pacifies the wall, and um, so that can be a nice thing to do. Uh, it can suffer if your opponent has instant speed removal in response to the creature you play it on, then you lose Undying Rage, uh, and plus two plus two for three mana is not a good deal by itself. Um, and then, yeah, your creature can't block, so that's a bit of a disadvantage. Um, so I think the card is solid. Uh, I do cut it a lot, even in aggressive decks. I think there's just other, like, better ways to pump your creatures. Um, but the card's definitely fine, and, uh, like, it's not as good as Rancor, um, but sometimes it'll play a similar role. So I'm going to give it a C-. minus. Next up is Wildfire Emissary. Three and a red, two, four, protection from white. One a red, you can give it plus one plus so until a turn. Now, as a main deck card, uh, it's actually okay. Some of the times you'll face a white deck, and it can be quite good. Um, and otherwise, two four with the pump ability, it's marginal. Um, so so far, I haven't ended up uh, main decking this card, uh, but it's a very nice sideboard card. Um, so can't be pacified. Uh, it allows you to attack past some of your opponent's creatures if they're white, and yeah, just dodges, dodges some removal. Uh, so yeah, nice sideboard card. Uh, if you have to play it main deck, I think it's okay, but um, yeah, usually you'd want something uh, maybe a little cheaper, a little more aggressive, but it is something I like to pick up uh, for a sideboard slot, so I'm going to give it a C. Next up is World Gorger Dragon. 3-3 three and three red, it's a 7-7 seven, seven flying trample, when it enters the battlefield, exile all other permanents you control. When it leaves the battlefield, return the exile cards to the battlefield under their owner's control. Uh, so if you play this and your opponent plays pacifism, you lose. Uh, so it's, it's certainly a risky card. Um, and I, like, even if they don't play pacifism, I don't know. I'm not. I'm not sure that the seven-seven is necessarily going to end the game quickly enough. Um, losing all permits you control, you lose all your options, um, and that's not what you want to do in Magic. You want to have options. So uh, I, I can maybe see if you're a really aggressive deck and you're just all burned to the face. You play this as your top end, your one-six drop, and then it's just going to guarantee to you like an extra seven damage to finish things off maybe it could be okay there uh, but mostly people are going to be playing it to try to combo it with with uh, animate dead um, I, I'm not going to explain the combo in depth I haven't actually played it but it basically flickers the world gurger dragon in play and out of play uh, as the animate dead leaves play and when it comes back you get the dragon back and you can float mana every time all your permanents come back if you have something like a Gitu Slinger, it'll trigger every time it comes back, and this is an infinite loop. So uh, as long as you want to keep doing it with the Animate Dead, so you can get you know infinite mana, uh, or you get infinite triggers of a Gitu Slinger, which is lethal. So um, yeah, it's a cool combo, uh, but it does require three cards for it to work. You need the Dragon, the Animate Dead, uh, maybe even four cards. Like you need a way to get the Dragon in the graveyard. And then you need a way to kill your opponent. So that's actually like four cards that you need to set this up. So you have to have a pretty specific deck. Uh, Faithless Looting can help find pieces of the combo and get the dragon in the graveyard. So that's going to help. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's something that you can do. Uh, I don't know if I'll be trying to pull that off. And this card is a mythic, so it's kind of rare for that to happen. Um, yeah, so there's a chance you just ruin your draft trying to make that work, but I could see it happening, and maybe I'll fall into that situation. I've got a couple animate deads, I see a dragon, I already have a get-to slinger. Um, I might go for that, but uh, I'm going to give it a D.
And our last red card is Young Pyromancer. One and a red, two one. Whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, put a one one red elemental creature token onto the battlefield. So two one for two. It's not a good rate. You wouldn't play it by itself. Uh, but once you play your first instant or sorcery and get a one one, you're already pretty happy with the deal. And then anything beyond that is gravy. I have had some red decks that only had four instants and sorceries, and I just cut the pyromancer. Uh, I mean, you'd like to get seven or eight for the Pyromancer to be good. Um, but if you're playing red-blue and you have flashback spells, then you know those seven or eight spells, uh, some of them can be cast twice. So you can actually get like you know, 14 triggers uh, throughout a game. Uh, so it starts to get very good in the red-blue deck. Uh, and it is a very high pick there. Um, and otherwise, I think is solid. Um, but uh, yeah, it might require you to take some instance or sorceries higher to make it work. Uh, and you don't want to invest too many cards for uh, you know, what's probably going to be one card in your deck. If you can get multiples, um, I think it could be pretty powerful to just uh, take flashback cards really high and make a lot of tokens. And the card is pretty nice in the red-white tokens deck. Um, if you have raise the alarms, uh, it makes a token with Rally the Peasants, so maybe you'll, you'll just do a Rally for three one turn, and then you flash it back the other turn, and you get an extra token out of it. So, yeah, overall good card. Uh, it can be very good in some decks, uh, but overall I'm going to give it a B. So that does it for red. It is a pretty good color this time around. There are some nice aggressive decks. Um, it's part of maybe the best archetype, red-white tokens, and has a lot of potential with the Burning Vengeance deck. And uh, can also go well in like a three color removal heavy deck since it's got great removal. So I think red is a, in a good place in this format. I don't mind first picking red cards and I think you should too. So hope you've enjoyed this part of the review. Uh, I'm gonna be coming back for green cards very soon. So I hope you enjoyed this and I will see you next time.